Welcome to SciShow Tangents, this delightfully competitive science knowledge showcase. I'm your host, Hank Green, and joining me this week, as always, is science expert, Sari Riley. Hello. And our resident everyman, Sam Schultz. Hello. If there could be an animal that doesn't exist that you wish it could exist, what would it be? I will answer first. Okay. Okay. I thought it would be a pelicorn, which is a pelican <laughs> that's a unicorn. That also. sounds scary. Yeah. It sounds but I not very I, useful. Well, yeah. It, well, it turns out what happened was I was I don't know if this is gonna be out yet when this podcast comes out, but I keep a lookout for it. I was just on uh, Drawfee this morning, like we recorded an episode. Drawfee is a show oh, where you that's they get very like, cool. weird prompts and then they draw the prompts and I gave them animals I wished existed. And uh, the first one uh, was was not the pelicorn, but the pe- second one was a pelicorn and it turned out not as glorious and magical and mystical <laughs> as I would have liked. It was terrifying and uh, I don't want it to exist. So pelicorn <laughs> is right out. But the thing that turned out really great was the Tyrotosaurus rex, which is a giant otter that is also a reptile and it really loves coffee and it goes hard. Uh, And um, it it could totally tear you apart and kill you, but it wouldn't because it's adorable and lovely and happy. That's what I want to exist. A happy, kind, thoughtful, giant otter dinosaur. Good. (laughs) More happy and thoughtful animals would be nice. That couldn't hurt, <laughs> could it? No. Yeah. Totally. That's the vein I was thinking, too, before even learning about the tire. Ty- ty- how do you say it? Tyratus. Tyrotter. 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 Rex. Um, I was thinking, like, so a glass frog, which are those tiny little guys that you can see mm-hmm. through. Mm-hmm. See their little organs? They're sometimes mm-hmm. greenish, sometimes clearish. But the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. And they're very friendly. Very friendly. (laughs) That's part of the description. Uh, And I don't know. You could like ride on their backs sometimes. They'd like carry you across the water. They'd be a little slimy, but very lovable. And Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's just just Yoshi. Yeah, you can just hang out. I want well, Yoshi. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe what we want is Yoshi. Yeah. And now that you've said it, I would like Yoshi, <laughs> Yoshi to exist. Would be fun. It'd be weird to go on Drawfee and be like, can you draw Yoshi for me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking but of a dinosaur. Yeah. Yoshi, but I want to see his heart. <laughs> yes, that's what I want then. Yoshi, but transparent. Aww. So I can okay. learn a you thing. You can see his point. great big heart. Yeah, see yeah. his great big heart. He's see got, his little guts. Part. And when he like eats you, you can see yourself inside. Yeah, you can see the apple-shaped Ooh. blob like go in and then yep. yeah. squish into poop. You gotta be able to see the poop. It's important. It's vital. How else will you know he needs to poop? <laughs> <laughs> An animal that I wish existed was a um talking um bird. How about that? Those exist. Those exist, They're- Sam. Shoot. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Dream a little bigger. Okay. A little bigger. Imagine, oh. yeah. Hmm animal that i wish existed was a one of them like in the flintstones where they have the vacuum that's an elephant and he would like, <laughs> vacuum your floor for you but be your pet. Uh, yeah that's great all of those animals that. would be great actually if we the could... ones that that just for some reason instead of having scissors they had like a pterodactyl <laughs> yeah <laughs> somehow yeah yeah you want that elephant that likes every kind of fuzz up its nose yeah it's their favorite thing to do is just go mm-hmm. around and suck it up and say <laughs> it's a living and i'd say you're right <laughs> and i have to pay him every week i guess too everybody we're at scishow tangents on twitter tell us which animal you wish existed and then we'll all like each other and have a good time that sounds like a great conversation for twitter i need more good i would love to do fake animals just hide from the other stuff <laughs> yeah please don't show me anything i that doesn't make me happy yeah. at this point i'm tired <laughs> every week here on tangents we get together to try to one-up amaze and delight each other with science facts while also trying to stay on topic and failing our panelists are playing for glory but they're also playing for hank bucks which i'll be awarding as we play and at the end of the episode one of them's gonna win they're gonna win the episode and they're gonna go home feeling that particular rare joy now as always we introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem this week it's gonna be from me a collection of people just a few is definitely not anything new 
And a few more than that, and then, again, that's a very old trend. Multiply that by a dozen and see it's starting to look a bit weird to me, and multiply that again by 10,002. That's something that's entirely new. It can be pretty or gritty, but not itty-bitty. You can pack us together, and you get a city. A city that clings to the side of a hill. A city that's home to a lumber mill. A city that needs a giant landfill. A city that's <laughs> just Jacksonville. A city that millions <laughs> of people... <laughs> a city that's millions of people reaching for something they can't describe. For thousands of years, we've done this, but still, we do not know why. That's my city poem. It was a beautiful city city poem. The city is probably not a thing that's particularly easy to define, except that it is definitely a large gathering of people who all live in one place. Yep. But the, the lines between it, I often am not sure whether I live in a city, for example. They're very blurry. Oh. Everyone, it seems, takes the I'll I'll know it when I see it yeah. definition approach, which, mm-hmm. you know, we've done for plenty of episodes here because it's easy. Yeah. You can say, here's the line. Well, it's almost not hard because everybody agrees that nobody knows what a city is because it, like, it's not like like one more person moved to town. We officially are a city, though. I think in some places it's, it is it is legally designated, right. um, but that's, that's just the law. That's which is where also, it gets complicated, yeah. where people okay. have to define a city for quantitative studies because oh, you know us okay. scientists we've got to be <laughs> like we've got to set a threshold even if it's arbitrary and then a bunch of people set different thresholds for laws and for studies and for oh yeah i don't know mostly laws and then things mm-hmm. get complicated so for example using different countries everyone has a different minimum population size to define an urban area or a city so can be like 200 in Denmark, 2,000 in Argentina, 5,000 oh. in India, 50,000 huh. in Japan, even 100,000 huh. in China, which are still Whoa. like relatively small. Yeah. Well, I mean, Missoula is 70,000 and sometimes I straight call it a town. Yeah. 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 Usually it seems like from what I found across the internet, and by that I mean a couple papers that I had time to look at, uh, yeah. <laughs> is that statisticians generally have settled around uh, at least 50,000 inhabitants, but then also a certain density of that. Yeah, you can draw a line that it has 50,000 people in it. Mm -hmm. In any place with 50,000 people. (laughs) (laughs) But it has to be around um, 1,500 inhabitants per square kilometer. Just not too, too densely packed. I don't have a... Sure. Comparison for that. Mm-hmm. But it seems like the the definition of city versus town versus village or whatever is people, the density of the people. And then you can start layering on other sociological and other concepts like building structure, cultural, behavioral approach, like the mm-hmm. the diversity in languages that you find in an area. Mm-hmm. Are you going to classify it as a city? But numbers well, then, are the easiest one to. Draw but then the there's line. also like the reality that that a lot of cities were used to be like a bunch of smaller towns, and they just got sort of like Smooshed lumped into together. one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, you like you, L.A. is this way, where it's Los Angeles, but then it's like lots. They used to be lots of different pockets that just all got connected together, and and now at what point does it is it not Los Angeles anymore? Like. Is the, and and there are even places like there's in holdings in LA. Like I feel I think I don't know which one it is, but there are little places that are like, nope, we're not LA. We're right. so entirely surrounded by LA, but we're not yeah. LA. The Vatican situation. Yes, yeah, the Vatican situation, <laughs> but it's Burbank. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of the Pope, it's Rhett and Link. Yeah. So I don't know when when that comes. So a lot of languages only have a couple words for cities too. It's like you got the big one and you got the small one. And English has three, like city, town, village. I would have guessed we had more. We have we have more. I guess Hamlet. you start subdividing Hamlet. 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 Yeah. Hamlet. Okay. Burrow. Uh-huh. <laughs> Harry, do you know anything about et- etymology of these words? You know, the etymology of city is just as complicated as the, our definition of city in that mm. we just used a lot of words to describe places that people lived. So yeah. city comes from uh, Latin civitas or civitem, Mm, um, which is Mm -hmm. more applied to like citizenship or a member of a community. 
So Mm -hmm. it's like, uh, and came from the word civis, which means like a town's person. And then there was a companion word that meant a city in Latin, which was herbs, which Mm -hmm. is a great word. I don't know why we don't have words like herbs anymore. (laughs) Uh, And then it seems like historically as Rome fell and lost its prestige, then herbs was out and Mm. civitas was in. And then we were like, we're not calling them herbs anymore. We're calling them cities. But they can still be urban. But they can still be urban, yes. But the 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 idea of urbanness carried on throughout history. But we just don't call them urbans. We call them urban centers, I guess, because city now. Yeah. And we can cut. Sometimes the suburbs are the burbs, which is very close to herbs, but not quite there. The, the herbs and the burbs is the, the name of every Hallmark Christmas special. <laughs> I guess it's rural usually. So the herbs and the herbs and the burbs. The herbs, the herbs, and the burbs coming together for love on Christmas Day. Always. That Christmas tree farm isn't going to do its own books. It's going to do its own social media postings. <laughs> a hot shot from the herbs to come here. To the herbs. All right. Before we get too deep, it's time to, for us to move on to the quiz portion of our show. Are you ready to be quizzed? Yes. It's going to be uh, a city's true true fail. Life can be tough in the big city, and it can require lots of changes and adaptations for humans, but also for animals. So scientists have been studying city animals, leading to some very educated hypotheses and conclusions about how our habits and buildings have changed our animal neighbors. The following are three possible tales of city-based animal evolution, but only one of them is rooted in actual scientific fact. You're going to have to tell me which one. Story number one, summers can make city streets unbearably hot, of course. But alas, animals still find themselves needing to hit that pavement. So in San Juan, the Puerto Rican crested anole, or anole, has been adapting its lizard body to deal with that heat by growing an additional layer of skin on its feet that shields it from all that heat on the pavement. Hot foot. But that not, might not be the true fact. It might be story number two. One of the first things about going to a new city is that you got to find some new places to eat. But all that food can be overwhelming (laughs) to both our choices and our bellies. To make good use of discarded takeout food throughout New York City, white-footed mice have upgraded their metabolism with genetic changes that make them better able to digest fatty foods. But that also might be a lie, and it might be this one. Story number three. In a city full of crowds and noise, it can be hard to stand out, but everybody's still looking for love, which means that everybody's also looking for clever strategies to get a date, even if they are birds. In the city of Leiden, great tits make their songs stick out to potential mates by developing new melodies that are actually copied from popular hits that can be heard on radios throughout the city. So, is it story number one, lizards developing pavement protective paws? Story number two, Pizza mice, or story number three, great tits cover human songs to stand out in the crowd. For the first one, lizards developing little hot feet. Hot feet. That makes sense, I think. It does make sense. Yeah, it does get hot. hot. You get, you can't have shoes. They can't buy lizard shoes in this economy. No way. No. But you can (laughs) walk around Uh and just get thicker skin. I can't think of any compelling reason that could, that wouldn't be it. Well, there are there are two two other options it could yeah. be. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so that's well. that's the main one. What about pizza mice, Sam? I feel like you have you would so have good thoughts. So what are they doing? Their 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 genome has changed to uh, allow them to better digest fatty foods. So like mice might traditionally eat okay. grain, but now they eat a lot of cheese <laughs> uh, and etc. Just like fettuccine Alfredo, bacon. A little prosciutto. All yeah. those big city foods. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're hanging out at the Olive Garden. Well, yeah. my first thought was that white-footed mice aren't real. Is that, are they? No, they're real. Oh, okay. Well, that blows out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> Great tits are also real. <laughs> yes. I know that one. And anole lizards are also real. Anole lizards? Mm-hmm. I don't know how to say it. I like anole better, so I'd like to motion it be anole. Oh, Ooh. Jay says anole. Anole. Oh. That sounds like a pasta, though. Pizza <laughs> yeah. mice are eating the anole. <laughs> <laughs> the anole Alfredo. Yeah. <laughs> that was my Italian accent. Yeah, <laughs> I think, shockingly, mine was a little better than yours. It was so the anole Alfredo. <laughs> 
Okay. Well, then the third one, the tits, the tits uh-huh. um, singing the pop songs. I would say, I don't think they're they're known to be one of the birds that talk of Sam's yeah. mythical dreams. I don't I don't know if they they have enough mimicry. And I guess with with enough urban exposure. The question is, do y'all know enough about great tits to know whether they're good at mimicry? I don't even know what they look like, and I'm too afraid to Google it. <laughs> no, they're just like a little normal little bird. They look kind of yeah, like they a, look like normal little birds. Like a like if you okay, pictured a, a quintessential bird in a picture book, they look like that. I think yeah, oh. they, look, they look a little like that. That's a great tit. Yeah, no, and I googled okay. great tit just now, and it is all birds. Those little guys ain't down. mimicking anything. They're just going do 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 do. Their heads are too small to keep all that stuff in their brain to mimic it. Uh, I'm gonna go with pizza mice because I think I like the little. Ratatouille. It's Ratatouille in real life. He eats a pizza. While you were talking, I came around on the pizza mouse thing. I think that is the one it is. Because you said the thing about the they were eating gray, now they're eating cheese. I feel like that makes sense to me. And they probably can like change really quickly their genomes, right? Isn't that something mice can do? (laughs) I mean, I think it's something that happens to it's evolution, yeah, natural it selection, to, and it is a thing they that probably happens do to all species. Like that, they're like, "I need to eat this cheese right there away." There does seem to be some indication that certain animals can evolve faster than others, which is very interesting and something that maybe should also go on my sci-show list. If cheese is on the line, you're evolving to eat. Well, also, just Things. fast generations. They make a lot of babies that's really true. fast. Yeah, so that's, that's natural one of the ways, selection. For sure. just, so I will yeah. second. But lizards also make a lot of babies. It's true. And uh, nobody's have, buying your lizard story, Hank. Come on, we're going with Pizza Rat. Well, researchers have found that the Puerto Rican crested anole has been adapting its feet to city life by making them better able to climb buildings. So not... You're right! <laughs> oh, okay. It's like the Pizza Rat! <laughs> it turns out that like buildings are smoother than the stuff that those anoles would, yeah. or, or anoles would normally climb True. in nature. And so they have a- adapted their feet to be better able at climbing smooth buildings. But cool. Pizza Rat or pizza mouse, is true. A paper published in 2017 compared white-footed mice living in parks inside New York City to white-footed mice living in parks outside the city, and the research sequenced their genetic material, and they found that in general, the city mice had changes in genes that helped digest and metabolize lipids and carbohydrates. Uh, The interesting thing here is that scientists working on this paper disagree about what could be driving the changes, at least as of 2017 when the paper was published. One of them thought the changes might be due to the types of plants and insects available in the city versus uh, not city parks, whereas the other went with the cheeseburger hypothesis <laughs> where the idea is that the mice are adapting to fatty foods that are in the trash, which honestly that makes a lot more that sense adds to me. Up, yeah. But uh, figuring a, out the actual reason is going to require a little more study. You got a bug in front of you and a chicken strip or whatever. A cheese- oh, I mean, God, there's so much food inside of uh, a just a, a quarter of a hamburger. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the great tits, this is actually really interesting too. They were not mimicking songs, but they did adjust their songs in different parts of the city based on the way that noise travels. So oh. there's places where there are uh, a lot of ambient noise, which is lower frequency. And in those places, the tits sang higher frequency songs to be heard over that noise than in places where uh, there wasn't as much of that rumbly, bumbly noise. They were doing some sound engineering, just like our friend Tuna. Make my frequencies pop, Tuna. Yeah, you great tit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. All right, so that means that Sam and Sari both get the point. We're going to take a short break now, and then it'll be time for the Fact Off. All right, everybody, get ready for the fact off. Our panelists have brought in science facts to present to me in an attempt to blow my mind. And after they've presented their facts, I will judge them and award Hank Bucks any way I see fit with uh, an emphasis on which one of these is going to make the best TikTok. There's a trivia question, though, to decide who goes first. In the 18th century, the city of Paris had a problem. They had too many dead bodies lying around in mass graves in their cemeteries, creating unsanitary conditions for the city's residents. That's 
It's a problem for the city of Paris. All, uh, it's not a problem for the, the dead people anymore. They're <laughs> fine. So they decided to handle this problem by throwing those corpses into pits that the Romans had dug up long before to mine limestone. The final result is known as the Paris Catacombs, a network of tunnels under the city that are filled with these skeletal remains that have been deposited there. Approximately how many bodies were moved from those cemeteries to the Paris Catacombs? Oh. Did you say what year it was? I said that it was the 18th century. Okay, 1700s. that's a long time. I feel like for France to have been there, but I don't know when that started. Uh, you're a Halloween expert, Sam. I feel like you would you're going to be good at this question. Ooh. Yeah. How What's many the bodies? Number. Yeah. How oh, many give me a, bodies? Give me a is too many. Number. How many bodies yeah. is like it goes from being cool to ugh, <laughs> and then you well, start shoving them somewhere. Else. Skeletons are different. Bodies is one. <laughs> yeah, skeletons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> skeletons. <laughs> Very though, true. Is yeah. 700,000 skeletons. Okay. Oh. If it's 700,001 skeletons, you got to get me out of there. Okay. Okay. I'm going to say 400,000. Six million. Oh, my ah! God. <laughs> I knew it was going to be way more than that. I'm that, not. That. I have no sense of scale of big numbers. How long would that take? Uh, well, I think it happened over a fairly long period of time. And initially, the catacombs, which are around 20 meters under the ground, so pretty far down there, uh, uh, it the, the was just like sort of the bones just were kind of piled and dumped inside. And then later, this guy, uh, Henri Carr, day three, that's my French accent for you. Uh, just start, decided, I don't know if he decided or if he was sort of hired for this. I assume that somebody was paying him. He started to arrange the bones into something more artful. And now you can go and see these very kind of intense human remains oh, structures that are built down in the catacombs. I hope somebody asked him to do that. Yeah. It's not just like, like I don't know. I, got, I didn't really know what else to do with my time. Um, there are about 300 kilometers worth of tunnels down there. Only 1.5 kilometers are open to the public. So 300 kilometers of tunnels Lots will, of secret fill, bones. Will, will fit 6 million skeletons. Jesus. I had no idea. I thought that that was like a religious thing. But no, the catacombs. No. They well, were... it was consecrated. They did like sort of like say, this is a religious this place. This is now. fine. What like, we're bones. doing is fine. Yeah. Put the bones there. <laughs> <laughs> We promise it's we Don't promise it's great. It. God said it was cool if we did this. All right, Sam, that means that you get to go to decide who goes first. I think I'll go first. I like to go first now. I'm being brave. Like I said That's before, right. I'm right. brave. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're a monster. A monster? Yeah. Professional. You're going after it. Cool. You're a champion. Well, I like that. These are nice the things. Nobody ever says anything nice about me. <laughs> a lot of birds are not great at regulating heat. They can't sweat, so they pant to cool down. But panting requires a lot of muscle movement, which also generates heat. So it's not the most efficient cool down method. And birds' insulating feathers can also work against them by trapping lots of heat close to their bodies. So it just kind of sounds like it sucks to be a hot a bird. Hot bird. And baby birds are babies. And much like babies are worse at everything than adults are, baby birds are worse at heat regulation than adult birds. Uh, They mostly just have to depend on their parent sitting on them to keep them in okay temperature, which also Mm -hmm. doesn't sound like the best way to do it. But yeah. Well, they've been around for a while, so what do we know? And these (laughs) bird temperature issues are exacerbated exacerbated (laughs) (laughs) by global climate change. So I found several reports from organizations about baby birds dying in their nests or dying from trying to leave their nest too early to like find somewhere cooler to go, which Mm. is just grim and horrible. Mm -hmm. And you would think that since cities are heat sinks, meaning that due to what they're made out of, uh, cities tend to be hotter than like the area around them. Uh, Mm -hmm. Baby birds that live in cities would be doing way worse than baby birds that live in like the woods. However, a recently published study looked at 760 broods of great tits. I was scared to say it, but you said it for me. (laughs) From 2013 to 2018, half of which lived in cities and half of which were in forests and found that as the number of hot days in a given year increased, the mortality rate of city-based chicks did not increase and in fact seemed to decrease. I think is what the paper was saying, as opposed to forest dwelling chicks who died more often as the amount of hot days increased, even though cities were indeed hotter 
than the woods that these other great tits were living in. They find the air conditioning. They go and <laughs> they go to Barnes and Noble like the rest of us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they go into Starbucks and they get a cup of water. <laughs> they just stand there for a while. A few other things that they noticed: urban great tits usually laid fewer eggs, and their chicks had less feathers and were smaller. Mm. And these adaptations most likely come from their city slicking lifestyle. So since cities were already warmer, these birds yeah. were possibly laying less eggs uh, because less babies equals less body heat. And their chicks maybe got a leg up by growing less feathers to keep cool. <laughs> and city birds were generally smaller, which could be attributed to less food availability in cities. But the researchers also cited previous studies of city-dwelling animals like birds and insects that found that it's common for city animals to be smaller than rural it's common for city animals to be smaller than rural ones. <laughs> the rubens. <laughs> yeah. Urban the birds. Urban. Urban. Uh, and also common for smaller animals to be more resistant to extreme temperatures. Uh, meanwhile, rural birds didn't have to adapt <laughs> to such an extreme change, uh, and they haven't caught up adaptation-wise as the world mm-hmm. heats up. So in conclusion, sorry birds for global warming. That's our bad. bad. Mm -hmm. But also, they should be thanking us for building the harsh, unnaturally warm asphalt hellscapes that have prepared some of them to live in the global hellscape to come. Rural birds are are in trouble. But those urban birds, the 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 urban birds, are going to do great. That's weird. I'm look at, I want to see little pictures of these tiny little hairless baby birds. <laughs> oh, man. These like tiny hairless birds. baby tits. And I'm scared to go- to Google great tits, more scared to Google great tit chick. I can't look that up. <laughs> Just look my up parental baby. my parental alert will go off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is my work computer. So so this seems to be another uh like could have been in the truth or fail animals yeah. adjusting to cities yeah which of course they do and um and and in lots of ways i always thought that squirrels should evolve a sort of brighter color scheme so that i they're less likely to get hit by the cars they're exactly road colored i That's know not right. don't do that yeah. yeah be like bright pink all right sari what do you got so much infrastructural engineering goes into cities like getting electricity to people safely and efficiently An important piece of that puzzle is substations, where there are incoming power lines, outgoing lines, and a bunch of machinery in the middle that helps process the electricity in some way. Uh, For example, that's great. Yeah, Yeah, that's that's, yeah. Uh I'll list some examples in case you want some electricity words. For example, some can change the voltage of electricity to make it easier to go long distance, Mm, or Mm -hmm. safe for consumers to use, so raising it or lowering it. Switch Mm -hmm. from AC to DC current. Or lots of other important transitioning things from big system to personal use. And in many areas, these substations look very industrial, with steel structures supporting all the metal machinery, surrounded by a chain-link fence, and big warning signs. But that's not the case in some parts of Toronto, Canada. Uh, So the city of Toronto started to have electric power around the 1880s, supplied by private companies. But in 1911, the municipal electricity company Toronto Hydro was established, helping funnel electricity from generators at Niagara Falls, among other places, to residents. And as part of this, they needed to build more substations in neighborhoods, especially as the urban area grew post-World War II. But instead of sticking with the classic industrial structure with keep-out signs, Toronto Hydro hired a bunch of architects to disguise neighborhood substations in whatever building style the neighborhood called for. So basically, during the 1950s and 1960s, Toronto Hydro built a bunch of fake film set houses uh, and office building-shaped boxes with circuit breakers and voltage dials and heavy equipment inside them instead of, you know, living spaces for humans. These houses still had decorative windows, landscaping, and working doors for engineers to go inside, and if you look at pictures, they look pretty darn normal besides the occasional chain across a driveway or a warning high voltage sign plastered on a door. I really looked for this, but there aren't a wealth of city planning texts online, but a 2016 conference proceeding from an architectural historian named Amy Clark describes how this sort of architectural camouflage was a big trend throughout the 20th century, not just with electrical transformers, but with public transit ventilation or other city utilities that needed to be sprinkled amongst homes. And while these buildings maybe didn't reflect an industrial strength or what was going on inside, she writes that they, quote, contributed to an experience of suburban life that matched the aesthetic expectations of the communities, end quote, which (laughs) basically means people don't like ugly things and want to pretend that they're in a little, little 
quiet little community uh-huh. humdrumming along. So hide all the the big machines. I don't want to think about power plants. Yeah, I, yeah. I, this is also done with pump stations, which like sewage pump stations where you like most sewage just sort of travels downhill, but eventually th- there is no more downhill to travel. So you have to pump mm-hmm. it back up. And there's a bunch of pump stations that just look like houses. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and the and, but like literally the if you look the windows aren't like they you can't see through them. They're just glass in front of wood Dark. or like painted wood. Mm-hmm. But apparently the modern electrical grid doesn't require Toronto to build these kinds of small neighborhood substations anymore. So they're gradually going out of commission. I don't know about other public utilities how they're how they're going, but mostly. This was weird because I didn't know that these existed. And all this makes me wonder what the next movement will be in urban planning and infrastructure. Will we still want to hide our public works or do we want to draw more attention to them so that people can know how much work and cool things like cool science is going on in our neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I wish people looked at the substation and were like, wow. Look at what look at what we do together. Mm-hmm. But the Missoula, we've got a substation downtown that is right now being redone and they're, you know, they're putting like a big art wall around it so you can't see it and it's going to be huh. murals and stuff, which is also cool. Mm-hmm. But I'm also like, you know, that's a, there's a lot of like it's pretty amazing that we You got to go start standing down there giving people some talks. So I can go with Sam with the city-dwelling baby birds that might have a leg up in coping with global warming or Sari's old Toronto electric substations designed as houses. And you're tied, so I really have to pick which one of these is good and better. They're both good. I'm going to go with the baby birds because I was aware of the substations before. It's not a new fact to me, but it'd be a good TikTok, though. But I'm going to go with the baby birds. Now you can never do a TikTok about the other one, though. Legally. It's, a little, it's kind of a little bit of good news. You know, mm-hmm. it's a little bit good news because it's like, uh, it's like, look, we can, like animals can handle things if we give them the time to handle the things. Yeah, all and the animals the meantime, just have to move to the city. And yeah, everybody, be fine. Every, they'll don't worry, they'll figure it out. That's <laughs> yeah. the good news. We're good on global warming. The tits have figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> Now it's time to ask the science couch. Where we've got a listener question for our couch of finely honed scientific minds. At CrystalR99 and at Ryan Laser ask, does living in a city change your physiology? How about your immunity? Ooh. Changes those birds' physiology. It sure and them uh, uh, lizards and mice. You know, all I can say about this before Sari goes is I feel like somebody's done some research and it's found something interesting, but I have no <laughs> idea what it is. Am I right? Yeah, you're right. Uh, so <laughs> the one of the most cited studies that that tackles this topic was published in 2010 in the journal Evolution and specifically studied genetics from ancient humans or older populations of humans compared to modern. Um, And it's like a very difficult thing to study human evolution over time for a lot of reasons. But they specifically looked at 17 different human populations living across Europe, Asia, and Africa and analyzed DNA samples and found that populations that lived in more urban settlements um, had higher frequencies of a a gene allele um, that was resistant to tuberculosis and leprosy. So big diseases that spread Mm -hmm. through urban areas. And so that in itself, a lot of the clickbait articles about it, a lot of, I'll be nicer to the journalists, a lot of the popular science articles about this uh, equate that to, well, cities mean that you build up your genetic resistance to diseases. (laughs) No, that's not individuals. Yeah. (laughs) Not individuals, populations. That's populations. And so you have to think of the number of people that died of those diseases, and then the survivors are the ones that pass down the genetic resistance throughout generations. Um, And so really what the study concluded was uh, generally that infectious disease loads are higher in urban environments and right. like s- seriously affect human populations to the point where genetic markers can be passed down through generations. Like it affects human evolution to that level. But mm-hmm. they there is evidence that like increased pollution and toxins obviously in soil, water, air 
can lead to health impacts, whether it's uh, increased rates of asthma or cognitive disparities or all other kinds of physical illnesses, cancers, whatnot. Um, so then there's like that portion of it, which is the different places in society for a variety of reasons affect your health in different ways. And then there's the the whole idea of like, should I raise my kids in a city or in the country? Hmm. Because I don't <laughs> want them to be allergic to things. And right. that revolves around the idea of like the hygiene hypothesis, um, which is the idea that in overly sanitized spaces, people worry that children are not being exposed to enough microbes or like different allergens. And so then they build up these intense mm -hmm. immune responses to things that would otherwise be normal. There does seem to be some people who just get sick a lot less than me, particularly. <laughs> um, and immune systems are definitely different and, and some appear to be better than others. Yeah. Mine's, mine sucks. <laughs> Mine's pretty good. I think I, I lucked out in whatever genetic lottery. Yeah. I can't really smell, but everything else, I'm pretty <laughs> fine. That's not ideal, but also it's not that. there's some no. perks there. If you want to ask the Science Couch your question, you can follow us on Twitter at SciShowTangents, where we'll tweet out topics for upcoming episodes every week. Or you can join our Patreon and get access to our Discord and ask us there. Thank you to at CowboyCrab on Discord, at CammyJBoy and everybody else who asked us your questions for this episode. If you like the show and you want to help us out, super easy to do that. First, you can go to patreon.com slash scishowtangents. You can become a patron and get access to things like our newsletter and our bonus episodes and even our Cars 2 commentary. Second, you can leave us a review wherever you listen. That helps us know what you like about the show and helps other people know how great we are. And finally, if you want to show your love for SciShow Tangents, just tell, tell people, people about, about us. us. Thank you for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Sari Riley. And I've been Sam Schultz. SciShow Tangents is created by all of us and produced by Sam Schultz. Our editor is Seth Glixman. Our story editor is Alex Billow. Our social media organizer is Julia Buzz Bezio. Our editorial assistant is Deboki Chakravarti. Our sound design is by Joseph Tuna Medish. Our executive producers are Kaylin Hoffmeister and me, Hank Green. And we couldn't make any of this without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. And remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. But one more thing. City sewer systems are engineering marvels, and we have a variety of ways to unclog pipes that have too much poop and other junk inside, including spraying high pressure water or scraping out buckets of waste. In addition to those modern methods though, the city of Paris uses an innovation that was first showcased at the Paris World's Fair in 1878, giant balls. <laughs> These iron or wooden balls are custom fit to the diameter of various sewer pipes, the biggest of them being around eight feet in diameter. And they work exactly like how you'd think they would work. The balls get shoved through the pipes and scrape away all the poop on the side and they push the sludge out the other side. <laughs> They're doing some weird stuff underground in Paris is what we're learning today.